Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us today for a PHFA update, which is the last webinar in our 2020 Spring Affordable Housing webinar series. I'm Elizabeth Harriger, Partner and Director of Affordable Housing Services here at McConley and Asbury. McConley and Asbury is a team of CPAs and business advisors serving clients from our three offices in Camp Hill, Lancaster, and Bloomsburg. Our firm is a recognized leader in Pennsylvania for providing audit, tax, and consulting services to affordable housing developers and property management organizations. We have relationships with the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency and multiple investors and can assist developers in connecting with them or working through issues with them. Our firm currently serves over 125 affordable housing entities and in addition to providing annual audits and tax returns, our services include development cost certifications, 10% tests, 50% tests, and a variety of low-income housing tax credit consultants. For more information, take a look at the affordable housing page on our website and subscribe to our Affordable Housing Gurus blog to stay up to date on industry news and best practices. If there is any way we can serve you, please reach out and we will be happy to talk to you about how our affordable housing team can work with your organization. In addition to a niche in affordable housing, McConley and Asbury's almost 100 employees and eight partners provide services to a variety of industries, including construction, employee benefit plans, family owned businesses, healthcare, insurance, manufacturing and distribution, and nonprofits. Again, if we can help you or your organization in any way, please reach out to us. Before I turn things over to Holly, there are a few housekeeping items for today's webinar. If you have any questions for us during the webinar, you can submit them through the built-in questions function in the webinar control panel, and we will do our best to answer them during or after the webinar. And if you are looking to obtain CPE credit for today's webinar, you must answer all three polling questions that will be presented throughout the webinar. We're so excited to have Holly Glauser join us today as our special guest, presenting an update on low-income housing tax credits and other developments at PHFA. Holly has been with PHFA since 1990 and is responsible for the development and administration of the agency's multifamily loan programs, including low-income housing tax credits, Penn Homes, National Housing Trust Fund, and taxable and tax-exempt bond financing. Before we turn things over to Holly, let's get right to our first polling question. Is your organization planning to submit a tax credit application in the next funding round? So if you need CPE credit, you just need to make sure you answer all three of these questions. There are no right or wrong answers. We just need to see your participation. And we'd also love to have you answer the polling question, um, even if you don't need CPE credit, so we can kind of get a, get a feel for the landscape out there. So Holly, given the um, the current situation out there, are you anticipating maybe a slower tax credit application, um, a, a smaller turnout in the next funding round? Um, Elizabeth, I don't think so. I, I think that, you know, we, um, the last couple years have seen uh, our numbers drop a little bit. This this round, we received 74 applications. I would suspect that based on the number of questions and calls we've had so far with our interest for our next year's program, um, we're going to continue to have a, a robust um, application round. And, and I think it's clear from what we're seeing that 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 housing um, is really one of the number one priorities right now and affordable housing as, as we as we move forward through whatever next is. So I, I anticipate that um, there will still be a need. Um, I know that all of you on the line are, are already working on your pipeline. And, um, you know, we know that uh, how critical housing is to the success and the livelihood of folks that we serve. So uh, I would expect to, to continue. So I see I see, I see, see that red line, that pink line is, is pretty solid there. Yeah, yeah, so um, great. Um, with that, I'll turn things over to you, Holly. Okay, so uh, thank you, Elizabeth, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I certainly wish that I could, could see you all face-to-face at these sessions because it really is almost like a reunion. I, I know that I've been, when you look at those dates, 30 years, and, and I looked at that picture, um, and that's been a couple of years, and, and probably those of you who've seen me lately, um, the hair color has gone from red to lighter for a couple of while, and, and it's longer and everything else now as, as, we're, as we've been sitting home for the last three months. Um, so I do really miss um, connecting 
uh, face to face with everyone. And, and I have seen some of you on some Zoom calls and, and WebEx and, and a number of calls. And, and, and we really do appreciate your partnership um, during this um, brave new world and, and obviously responses to COVID-19. Um, again, when Elizabeth invited me to, to participate, uh, um, we had a date on the calendar. And, and I think that the, obviously the presentation um, had a little bit typically different bent than we are now and really appreciative of, of the opportunity to, to talk to all of you and answer questions you have and, and share with you um, where we've been over the last three months and where we're going. So um, again, a lot of challenges in all of our spaces um, from the development side, from the construction side, and, and then clearly from operations as you're working with your residents and, and your partners to make sure that, that critical needs and, and really the health and safety of your residents are, are taken care of. So um, with that, uh, I, and really the purpose here is, is the PHA, PHFA update, um, latest news and covered response. And um, I think, there we go, I'm in control now with the technology. So what I'd like to cover um, during, during this, uh, I guess, next hour is PHFA's response to COVID. Um, and this is just an overall outline. I'll just talk a little bit about what's happening here at PHFA. And I am actually physically located in my office at 211 North Front Street right now. Um, obviously, the impact on uh, multifamily properties, both the ongoing um, up and running tax credit and uh, multifamily properties, as well as those under development. Um, also touch on um, when we anticipate making awards for 2020. I think that's the question I get about three times a day. And then our um, 2021 program information, Elizabeth, that you uh, asked that question about. So um, start off, and it feels just like a time warp um, where, we, where we've where been over the last three months. Um, agency staff left this building midday on March 16th. Um, I think if you look at that data, that's when the governor announced um, really, really shutdowns. Um, but prior to that, and, and obviously understanding that um, COVID-19 um, was already here, um, prior to that date, uh, we had in, in our multifamily world, um, and also the whole agency, had really prepared our staff that um, when they came back the, that weekend uh, on, on, on Monday, um, March 16th, that uh, more likely than not, we were going to um, be out of the office for a period of time as, as really the, the numbers started to, to escalate here, obviously, in, in the whole country and in Pennsylvania. So um, actually, my staff and, and all the other staffs at the agency, even before we left, was prepared to leave the agency, bring work home with them. Uh, we know that closings were happening. We were getting pre-commitment packets and, and really very busy um, hoping to close really all those projects that had 2019 awards um, and that were in here and also work on the 2020. So, so we were really in a position when we left that we had a game plan. Um, I, I think we all thought, you know, uh, naively, I guess, that it would be a, a two month, a two week um, stint or at least a period of time. And um, obviously uh, most of agency staff currently is working remotely. So, and as is the rest of the world. So um, we were prepared to do that. Um, over the last three months, we are now really pleased that we're fully up. Actually, within the first month, I would say we were fully operational. Uh, we did not originally have systems in place that, that staff could work remotely. Unlike a lot of you who are able to do that and have the technology and have done it for some time, here at PHFA, um, you know, during the hours are here, all the technology sits here. And, and for lots of reasons, I think a lot of it is, is security and especially as our systems are integrated, um, as we are a single family servicer, and I have a lot of personal information. Um, we really like to keep everything uh, locked in the walls here at PHFA. So, you know, fast forward three months later, um, agency, all operations are, are fully uh, remotely. We've had board meetings. We've done, you know, webinars and, and really closings are happening uh, both in our single family home ownership side and also on the multifamily side. Um, just from our perspective here in the development world, um, this is the first week uh, we have are bringing staff in on, on a regular basis, um, really with the goal of finishing up the 2020 round and also work toward some closings that are happening. Um, staff, now that now that Dauphin County is yellow and going to green, but we have work groups going in and, and it's a bifurcated week. So we in teams um, Monday and Tuesday, and then another group comes in Wednesday, uh, Thursday and Friday, and we have some overlap. Not only is development staff coming in, but also technical services. 
are coming in so that we can turn around um, our plans review, uh, I, I think more rapidly um, before things were coming into the mailroom and until they got to someone's home and, and things like that, there was a, was a time lag. So really with the, with the goal um, of, of being safe and secure in this building, um, this building houses probably close to 400 people with a new addition. Um, sitting here today, there's about 45. So uh, we're taking all of the protocols and, and safety of uh, making sure that people are substantially apart when we're here. And in fact, most of the time we're talking on the telephone or email uh, just as if we were home. Uh, just a really very high level um, overview on just what fully operational means. Um, really in, in, our, in our single family space, our home ownership division, um, you know, our numbers look good. We are originating mortgages um, just as if we were here, you know, back in February. Um, we are, our purchasers are solid. I, I think the interest rate environment um, and also with folks really knowing that that home is where is, is um, essential, especially in, in, in this work from work from home environment, a remote environment. I, I think that there is lots of opportunity for home ownership, and I'm just, you know, we're we're pleased that everything is fully functional, functional, and um, our numbers are strong in home ownership. Uh, one of our biggest things when when we left, and I think more critical of of making sure that we were up and running remotely, is our loan servicing division, uh, PHFA services about sixty thousand single family loans um, and you know we, we we knew that obviously with uh, unemployment and the challenges that that folks are are um, faced with re with regard to uh, furloughs and unemployment that uh, challenges in, in being able to meet their mortgage obligations and, and obviously servicing is uh, is w was something that we were really acute to making sure that we had all systems in place um, to handle uh, some of the things. So one of one of the original CARES, um, well, it seems like such a dream a long time ago, but one of the first CARES bills was to um, provide opportunities to, or not only just opportunities, but there were some guidance with regard to forbearance and availability of forbearance in, in, in uh, federally backed mortgages, and, and we participated in a number of them. Um, I just received the numbers this morning from uh, Kate Newton, who is in charge of our servicing division, uh, uh, we have um, accepted or, or entered into forbearance agreements with 3,800 homeowners, which represents 3.9% of our portfolio. Um, and I think to not only our credit, but I think it's education with our homeowners, understanding that forbearance is not forgiveness, um, that 3.9% that is substantially lower than the national average. So the national average is over eight and a half percent of, of single-family homeowners going through forbearance. So um, more to follow. I think that there's going to be some opportunities uh, with um, FHA and VA and USDA to, 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 to help and do some additional workouts, but we're, we're really working with all of our homeowners and giving guidance and training um, both in the lender space and, and the homeowners. So, so that is, uh, was one of our main focuses when, when uh, COVID-19 um, hit and, and then the other program, which really also is is um, our book of business, is our HEMAP program, our Homeowners Emergency Mortgage Assistance Program, uh, that which is our for, or forbearance or foreclosure abatement program. Um, at this point in time, because um, of filings being stalled throughout the Commonwealth and, and the inability to actually uh, file for foreclosure action, um, that program is is um, we're waiting to see what happens in the, in the next month when um, when possibly um, some of those restrictions are lifted. Or, and so uh, again, we're, we're at the ready. So one of the things that we will go to, um, the, the PMAP program has been a 24 month program, um, but because of unemployment being as high as it is, um, we'll go to a 36 month program. So that's in, in the statute, in the statute. And then the last thing I, I think, which was one of the first things that we did um, w it back in March is, and, and I think too, um, and I, I, I'll give a shout out to Carl Dudek and, and his staff on uh, our asset management side. Um, a lot of the immediate things that needed to happen were really related to what happens with ongoing operations. You know, how do I submit my inspection reports? How do I do my tenant certs? You know, uh, in, in the Section 8, 
world, um, how are we con going to continue making payments? And so I would I, I give a, a big shout out and, and with Carl and compiling those. We do try to keep those active. I say check out the Q and A's. Um, I refer to them. It's they're now up to 14 pages. Um, so really anything anything new. And I also would just highlight our COVID-19 page on our website. Um, so when you go to www.phfa.org, uh, right on our website is is our COVID-19 page. There is also a um, the Q and A's and some other information are on the multifamily pages. Um, so I'm just going to give you just a, a little bit more information on how COVID-19 has impacted our tax credit projects and our resources. And I've just broken it down to those projects that are currently occupied, those that are under construction, and those that are in development. Um, I mentioned, uh, again, the, the Q&As, I do think that they are, are really the greatest source for all things on, on project operations, um, how to submit uh, file audits and how we're handling those and our management reviews. Again, we're doing everything um, at our desk for those of you who have properties that are uh, up and running. Um, again, work with your housing management rep and your financial analyst to, to get the information into us. Um, we are able to really do everything online. Um, I, I listed the tenant recertifications. Um, that is one thing that uh, the IRS has given us some guidance on, on some dates. And again, there's just been some limited guidance from the IRS um, with respect to the tax credit program. Uh, back in April, IRS noticed 20, 2023. Um, really, what it did was anything that was due um, in April extended them to July 15th. So if, if you're at a property and you have a research, um, there's some additional time till July. I would anticipate, and, and we'll see what happens if, if IRS extends some of those deadlines. So again, um, that covers some things, not all things. It actually not only covered the tenant research, but also covered um, the carryover allocations. But I'll, I'll cover that in a few minutes, um, how, we're, how we're looking at carryover dates and extensions of six months, because we did not have any 10% tests or anything during the six month period from, from that April to um, July in that space. Um, other things that we have in our notice out it really deals with late payments and evictions. I, I do think we are encouraging, and I'm sure that you are all doing it at, at your site, working with residents to ensure that they um, can remain in their homes. Um, and again, there are two, really two things. Um, if the project is getting federal assistance in the form of F, you know, HUD financial assistance, uh, tax credits is in the space, housing trust funds are in the space. Um, the inability to or really to stay evictions until um, the end of July. So that is in that is in there. And then uh, that's the 120 days. And then also uh, the, the Commonwealth of, of Pennsylvania has a, has a July 10th date. So um, we, we reference that in some of our materials. We also have issued and we did this, um, I think, earlier in May, a guidance for rental residents affected by COVID. Again, you know, hoping that Management works with, uh, you know, the residents so that they are able to um, stay in their homes and, and, and actually try to maintain as current as possible. You know, I don't think that every tenant situation is the same. Um, obviously, that, you know, there is a, an ability to to work with um, the, the residents to, to make sure that, you know, hopefully it may not be, and we're seeing this in the single family space, you know, you know, accepting partial payments or or forgiving late payment fees and, and really trying to work with residents to make sure that they um, are able to maintain their home and also access other services. So that's available on our on our website as well. Um, the last item I have on this list is property inspections. Um, again, I think as we're going through this uh, red, yellow, and then green in the Commonwealth, uh, things have, have, are starting to shift into seeing some more on-site activity. Um, Obviously, in the, in the red, uh, we were not visiting sites, and, and a lot of things were going to be done either either virtual. And, and actually, we're still making payments on on the construction side. I, I do know that um, the technical services reps and, and the housing management reps were actually having a meeting next week here at PHFA to talk about maybe changing some of our protocols for property inspection. So I would say, I'm sure that um, folks from housing management and technical services will be reaching out to you um, in the near future. To talk about what that what that looks like um, at sites. Uh, 
Um, oh, one of the other things, and I'm just, you know, if you have any questions along the way, I know that there's, there's a tool to ask questions, and I'd be happy to answer anything as, as it comes up. Um, one of the other things that, re, as a result of COVID, that came into play very early on um, were, uh, our, were hardship requests. And so if you, you have a, a mortgage with PHFA, uh, federally funded, uh, we have a couple projects that um, are in our risk share portfolio or in our RG538 portfolio that um, HUD, um, and actually the CARES um, mandating that there is uh, an ability to do a hardship request or, or forbearance agreements, and the forbearance is a 30-day up to 90 days. Um, we have on our website as well a, a one-pager that uh, is a multifamily relief request, and, and it talks about a, a bunch of things that we'd like to see as far as the 2019 audit and financials and rentals and, the, and as such. To date, we have not. Um, we received one or two requests, uh, but they really didn't come to, to give rise that there was a need for, for hardship assistance. Um, nationally, what we're hearing is that this is not unusual. Um, most states and, and most um, lenders have reported that uh, owners have not requested uh, forbearance relief. Uh, again, I think all of you know at your properties better than I do sitting here in Harrisburg, you know, what the, what the status is of, of your residents' ability to make payments. Again, I think it's a little bit different depending on, on where you sit with regard to maybe it's a sec, you know, if there's section eight, section eight project rental assistance or if it's a senior property, property or general occupancy. So I do think most projects at this point in time, occupancy is high and for the most part, substantially collecting rents. Um, the longer that this goes on or the, you know, with respect to unemployment, you know, that may be a different issue. But as, as of today, um, on June 17th, um, we really have not seen many requests for, for relief. Um, I actually want to go back to that. Um, in addition to, act, to uh, talking about forbearance, um, we have heard from a few properties, um, and actually a few that were in areas that um, had some hardships and destructions as, as it relates to um, some unrest in some communities and, and, and things that need to happen to, to storefronts and whatnot. Um, it, I know that, that Ed Newhart and Carl are looking at, is there an ability to uh, take mon monies out of the reserve for replacement or operating reserves to, to help projects? So again, um, that's what we would be looking to, making an accommodation to do some releases. So if you do believe that there's a hardship, again, reach out to Ed Newhart and Carl on um, what we can do to help you out um, in the short run. Um, so the good news is, as I was just talking about, you know, the ability for residents to pay rent and where we think we are as of the, the 17th of June, um, we are really excited about uh, that, that CARES in Pennsylvania is available for, for housing. Um, Governor Wolf on, on May 29th as part of, as part of the budget um, is PHFA is going to be the administrator of $175 million of, of CARES funding. Um, $150 million is, will be our rental relief program. The acronym is RRP and $25 million for homeowners assistance. And, their acronym is PMAP. Um, both of these programs um, really align pretty well. Um, they're both six months of assistance, uh, really commencing from the period of March 1st through November 30th. So, it, so it's a maximum of six months for either a homeowner or a renter. Um, November 30th is, is, the, is the end date because uh, these dollars have to be expended between um, now and the end of the year. Um, for really COVID-related um, challenges. And so what the homeowner or the renter would need to show is loss of income or 30% reduced income due to COVID. So those are, are basically the, the two um, entry points um, or really program requirements. And if I can just share, again, the Pennsylvania, I think the CARES number that we received, I, I think, out of CARES 3 is $3.9 million. I believe that 2. Point, I have the numbers here, uh, 2.6 has been allocated. There is still $1.3 million that um, the state may be looking to deploy. I know that we have lobbied or, or a group of the agency with the agency and many of our housing partners 
is looking to see if there's any way that we can enhance um, the 175 for either tax credit development or um, other other places in affordable housing. So so again, you may hear in the coming weeks of um, other 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 programs or other priorities to hopefully you know access some of those additional funds, which is a third of the CARES funds for housing opportunities. Um, in the in the rent relief program, CARES are um, it's RRP. I apologize for the typo. I said RPP. Again, I mentioned tenant eligibility is loss of income uh, or 30 percent of income since March 1st due to due to COVID. Um, the res the resident has to have filed for unemployment compensation. Um, in order to be eligible, uh, it's up to 100% AMI. So uh, in some other states or localities, they've looked at 50% or 60%. This program is going up to 100% AMI, um, and it could be used for any rental housing situation. Um, rental assistance would be up to 100%, but, but, but the cap is $750 a month. I mentioned earlier it's a six-month maximum and would cover any period from March 1st to November 30th. And the payments are made directly to the landlord, so it does not go to the tenant. The tenant has to apply, though. Um, so it can be a tenant application. It could be a landlord application on behalf of the tenant, but the tenant has to sign uh, some of the certifications. The agency is currently working on the final guidelines. Um, as you can see by the data, it just came into play a couple weeks ago. Um, we have to um, submit uh, some final documentation to the Legislative Reference Bureau next week. Um, we expect to be um, going live on our website and also answering questions. I believe it's um, June 29th, so that applications can start rolling in um, on at the beginning of July. It's anticipated that um, the applications will go into local county organizations. Um, Bryce Moretsky, and I know many of you know Bryce, um, and his group is working on a, a lot of the details with respect to the deployment. Um, again, this is very rapid deployment. This is the parameters, uh, basically, of the program. Again, um, loss of income or 30% of income due to COVID, filing unemployment compensation. The agency um, or our, our sub-recipient may be looked, we will, we will double, we will confirm, or there will be a process in place to confirm that uh, with LNI that the filing has been made and again, um, the dollars and, and the rental assistance will go direct to uh, the landlord. Um, and then, uh, and if I can just add on, on the homeowner side, again, very similar parameters and the, and the monies would go to the servicer. In that case, the agency on the, on the PMAP will be, administering the, will be administering the $25 million. Uh, next. Um, so, so I think in the in the beginning, this was probably you know on on March 16th one of the one of the biggest things that we heard from uh, from our partners is is really what happened when um, the the state turned red and and COVID came into play with respect to a pro the approximately 50 and I think there were more than 50 properties under construction, both 9% and 4% tax exempt. Obviously, as many of you know, construction was halted or delayed. Um, I think some of you um, couldn't really do, do much work in the buildings, uh, for example, an acquisition rehab rehab project with tenants in place or um, or the like, and, and that there was a process you know with the governor's office in DC to, to, to get waivers. Um, my understanding is some projects with a limited um, ability to move forward, but but again, obviously for for some time um, during a, a six week period, um, most most work were delayed or stayed. I mentioned inspection protocols. Uh, the agency was changing those up, but still making payments. Um, we did hear very early on um, some of the challenges may be um, increased costs due to COVID. So, you know, whether it's cleaning protocols um, and then I'll call it increased costs due to timing for completion. So again, you know, how, how would that six week or, or the delay impact the ability to move forward? And, and I'll use an act, uh, an act Rehab as an example. Um, you know, being it relocating tenants, the time, you know, additional time that might be necessary to place in service and, and um, projects that were maybe projected to complete 
June first now would be a might be a September or a year end. So so again, I think that that's one of the first things that we heard and and really try to address and and everybody work through. Um, everybody right away, uh, uh, and and I think there were some really great letters written on behalf of or by on behalf of our group, but by uh, folks like the Affordable Housing Tax Credit Coalition and CSHA, the ABA, um, to seek IRS guidance on all of the things that we have to do to dot I's and cross T's to avail ourselves of, of this program. Um, heretofore, we really have only gotten the two guidance, the one I mentioned earlier, the 2020-23, which is that, that extension to July 15th. But one of the things the service did tell us is that the disaster relief ref proc, which is 2014-49, would be available. So when the governor um, filed and it was accepted that the disaster um, for Pennsylvania, which was, I believe, March 30th, um, we could go out and actually do some extensions. And so really those projects that were under construction um, and most of those were 2018 9% projects, and then we did have you know, some 4%, but let's say those projects that were awarded credits in 2018, um, the ability to extend the placed and service deadline. So um, we did go out and issued guidance back in April um, to confirm that we were allowing developments to extend their placed and service period up to one year. So if you had a, a 2018 project uh, would have to be placed in service by the end of 2020, um, we are extending that place and service date to uh, 2021. Um, there is a mechanism, it is available on our website, um, basically sending an email into Linda Stewart, um, asking for that request, and there, there it's, you know, it's outlined of where those circumstances are. Um, some of you may have a swap of credits. Um, so again, it just, we do real, uh, swap slash reallocation. So really what we're thinking, the thought is those that were 2018s that were awarded were awarded in 2018, so you'd have a 2018 carryover or a 2019. Those are the projects that would be extended to the next year under, under that guidance. Um, everyone is still seeking additional guidance from the IRS on a whole host of um, regulatory relief that, you know, so to the extent that where is the 24 month period, um, uh, moratoriums on inspections and, and what happens with non-compliance and, and, and research, you know, we're, we're struggling with um, an extension of the compliance requirements because they will be more onerous. I think I mentioned this last year, um, the number of units that will have to be uh, inspected or, or reviewed for compliance monitoring. So we, we, there's a request for an extension um, on that, uh, extension on we have credits, and again, I think many of you are already familiar. The IRS um, is aware of it and acknowledging that you know there's a hope of relief, but but we don't have that yet. So again, for those projects that are under construction, which are primarily the 2089 percent and, and then some fours, um, we are granting relief of, of the place and service date. So the next group of projects I'd like to talk about are those that are um, in development. Um, specifically the 9% projects, and, and there are some tax exempt as well. So um, back in July, I can't believe it's almost a year already, but back in July of 2019, we awarded 9% credits to 39 developments. Um, those developments originally had a closing deadline of May 31st. Um, that is one of the first things that we did was uh, obviously um, waive that date. Um, for a number of reasons. Um, number one is uh, back in very early on um, on the logistics. You know, did we have the tools or were municipal offices open to even close a transaction? So let's just talk about all things were if they were tied up in a bow and ready to close, actually being able to pull permits, you know, filings and all that stuff, we knew would be a challenge. So so we did immediately delay our May 31st deadline. We have not announced an end, end date yet. So, you know, there is not, I'm asked that question frequently, you know, is the agency going to, or has the agency provided a, I must close by, um, I'll use an example, September 30th, we have, we have not done that yet. Um, one of the challenges that we've been faced with, and for those of you who have 2019 awards, um, we really did try to, um, and I think we heard you who are our, our, our um, 
participants and program um, partners. Um, touch deals less this year. So when the awards went out, we projects were awarded credits in July. Uh, the reservation letter went out shortly thereafter. Um, we had a, a pre-processing meeting back in September and, and really tried to outline what the pre-commitment process and the process was. Um, in 2019, out of the 39 developments that we awarded credits to, we awarded some kind of loan funding, whether they be a first mortgage, housing trust fund, RTT, to 33 of them. So we really wanted to devise a process that would create a smooth closings and expectations. Um, unfortunately, best laid plans are sometimes uh, go awry when there's a pandemic and, and, other, and other concerns. And when we left on uh, May, March 16th, prior to that date, not a single project had closed or really were in the Q2 close. So obviously that was another reason to um, delay May 31st. Um, I just highlighted a couple things, you know, what we anticipated the delays to be municipal and regulatory approvals. Third party, uh, you know, a lot of folks had to get some environmental remediation and that stuff. And in some cases, uh, funding gaps. So um, we, we, you know, at that time heard that, you know, we, there was a lot of unknowns with regard to increased costs or the availability of equity. And again, you know, we thought immediately that that waiving that deadline would be a, uh, an appropriate thing. Uh, just sharing with you right now what our pipeline status is. Um, again, out of those 39, 9% um, projects, we have had two that have closed. Uh, we have two that are scheduled to close. Actually, one uh, did close before the uh, May 31st deadline, and, and the other one closed, I think, the next week. Um, two are really close to closing. I, I think that they just need to get a couple file things to file. Um, six to seven are really, really close, so that we're at about 25% to getting close to 30% of those 39s closing. Um, most of them have not experienced cost increases um, due to COVID. I do know that there have been cost increases just due to, to bidding, um, and, and some of that actually happened or we knew of before. Uh, I guess mid-March, so I'm not sure necessarily COVID. There might be some ex exponential um, factors. We have six projects going to the board um, tomorrow for first mortgage financing, um, and we're doing closing. So, uh, you know, we're signing, we're recording, we're notarizing and doing all those things and, and reviewing plans. As I mentioned, you know, staff is in the office, and, and the reason we're in the office is, is really trying to streamline some of the processes and have some of the turnaround uh, available so that um, folks don't miss a window this summer um, closing some of these uh, 2019 projects. Um, I mentioned earlier, uh, again, uh, some guidance from IRS is, is the RevProc 2014-49, and this would be applicable to those projects that were 2019 awards. Um, we are, and in that same guidance, extending the 10% test for six, for six months for those projects that have the 2019 um, carryover allocation. So the new 10% test um, is, I think, April 25th um, of 2021. Um, we align those with those projects that received a forward commitment. So those projects also have a year. So we made April 25th the, the deadline. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the ability to extend the place and service date uh, for 12 months. I mentioned earlier, I just threw this in here, that, that 2023 covers that three-month period to July 15th, and just those additional things we're looking forward uh, from the IRS. And one of the things that is different in Pennsylvania, and, and I know every state that you may be in um, handles forward commitments a little differently. The agency has always looked as a forward commitment, um, the deadlines uh, to those dates as if uh, credits were awarded in the same or a carryover was for the same year of, of the award of credits. Uh, we went out again in, in this April with our with our 2020 forwards um, that would require our placed in service date um, similar to, to, to that 2021. Um, we do have some flexibility and, and I think we're going to be imploring it so if there's some a need for some additional time. The challenge in this 2020 is, and I will be interesting for those projects that are getting awards in 2020 um, and will actually enter into a 2020 carryover, um, there's nothing yet from the service to provide any additional time. And then I mentioned the compliance monitoring regulations. We're hoping for some relief 
um, for them to go into effect, because if they don't, they go into effect next year. Okay, I'm gonna take a breath now. Um, next thing I think a, a lot of you want to hear, and this is something I would normally, this is probably where I would have started um, had we all been together face-to-face, uh, -face, is what's happening with our 20, 29% requests. And this is just a broad overview. Um, we received 74 applications um, requesting 87, over $87 million of tax credits, um, $33.8 million in fair housing trust fund. These are monies from the National Housing Trust Fund uh, used to support persons at or below 30% of the area median income. Um, the agency had a cap on a per project of $1.2 million. Uh, many of the projects re requested close to that cap. The, the, the requests usually ranged anywhere between $500,000 and 1.2. There was one project uh, that was requesting fair Marcella Shale of a million dollars. Um, Pen Homes requests for those uh, pro properties in non-participating jurisdictions and projects um, sponsored by CHOTOs um, was $18.2 million. And um, based on the applications coming in, we received uh, $36 million of first mortgage requests. The next slide actually shows what our availability of funding is. Um, we have over $18 million. Uh, I put 18.1, 18 it's probably just slightly north of that, you know, as credits come back and, and get reallocated on swaps and some other things um, and some supplemental awards we've made, but $18.1 million of actual 2020 credits. Um, I don't think, and, and don't be um, nervous, anxious or anything yet, um, that that means that that is the amount that we will only allocate um, but you know we we will and i expect that we will do forward commitments um into our 2021 uh, resources um we have 9.9 .9 million of pen homes um that from dced uh, we might be able to access some additional dollars based on readiness and, and we're working with dcd to to make sure that we have enough to fund those projects that will be recommended um fair Again, Housing Trust Fund, um, we have 11.5 million, which is 2019 and 2020 um, Housing Trust Fund resources. Um, Marcella Shale, out of that one project, that one project is in, in a county, obviously, that um, designated, uh, if, if, if in fact it gets the credits, that the monies are available for um, fair funds for the Marcella Shale dollars. And I just wanted to mention one more time, you know, we made a change last year in our allocation or availability for Fair funds. Um, none of these projects um, have a new request for uh, really to transfer tax funds. Um, I'm, I'm going to go back and just keep this slide up for a second. Um, uh, one of the questions I think we're asked more, more, more times than um, you know maybe every other phone call or every other email has been uh, in the last couple weeks is when do we anticipate making awards? to the 2020 applicants. Um, we are on track um, to, with our goal of uh, making them at this point in time in August. Um, that is one of the reasons we brought people back into the office um, so that we can you know, dot I's and cross T's and finalize um, our, our pipeline and, and, and some of the preferences. So again, that's what we anticipate that the, not only the, the tax credits and all of our other resources for I'll call it the 9% projects, but also make our fair announcements um, at, at that time. So we're, we're hoping to, um, within two months time, be making awards. Um, I, I actually, I just wanna highlight something else. Um, some of you who, um, and, and I think it probably the, the, the email went out to, to everyone, um, Enterprise Green has changed some of its criteria and uh, for the 2020 program, and they are going to be doing um, a training. I believe it's on June 30th. And so, I, again, they, they, if, if, if plans were in the works, I think October 15th, as I recall, is the date if you're working with Enterprise. If you um, are successful in receiving funding and um, chose Enterprise Green as some of your categories, both mandatory and also um, selection criteria. I believe that there is some work that needs to be done between then and October 15th to maintain the 2015 
program requirements under under Enterprise Green. Um, otherwise, you'd have to go under the 2020. So I believe an email went from um, Debbie Clark earlier today. If you haven't received it, please let me know, and I'll make sure you get the information on the Enterprise um, training session. Talk a little bit about tax exempt volume cap activity. Uh, I, I do usually share this every year with with where we are. Um, lots of increased activity in the space um, and interest. Last year, uh, we received 17 applications and eight closed. Um, this is pretty much our history. About 50% of the projects um, that actually apply in the given year are able to close in the given year. Um, so we the the rest of them do move forward. What we are able to, in most cases, carry over the cap or work with to, to have it reissued. Um, so those remaining projects are, are hopefully closing. We've got a couple in the pipeline um, with closing calls and, and moving forward. We have had some of them that are, are a little bit more challenged because they're either at rehab and, and maybe some plans are in place to, to change up the scope of work because of, because of COVID-19. or um, Issues with regard to financial viability because of the the, the rate, the four percent rate is um, has dropped, and just to deal with some funding gaps, um, so or equity pricing. So they're a little bit in limbo, but hopefully they will all close this year. Um, and some of you, and when I looked at the list, um, are on our on our pipeline for 2020 tax exempt volume cap. Uh, we received uh, 23 applications, uh, preliminary applications. Um, April 1, um, 15, I believe is the number, 10 or 15, I, I have 15 here, but there, there were, now that I think about it, it was 10 or 12. Um, also requested FAIR, FAIR funds, and so um, we are holding those funds aside out of, out of the FAIR RTT for, for those projects. Um, one of the challenges, obviously, uh, when, we, when we, three months ago, um, was you know what is the likelihood ha that we only had preliminary applications by April one that projects would close in 2020 and based on our previous year activity we were just below 50 percent. Um, we wanted to be um, pragmatic and and really have a good handle on the likelihood and the viability of these projects to close. Um, it, the, our pipeline is robust and. We knew that maybe if it was an acquisition rehabilitation project or some portfolios, there might be some challenges in getting them to close. And, and maybe um, with regard to pricing and also um, the applicable percentage of the credit rate, that there might be some gaps. So what we what we did was originally June 1 was um, the deadline for full applications. We moved that to July 10th. Um, we sat back and we thought about you know what we would want to see to demonstrate the likelihood of a 2020 closing. Um, so we added some additional things to the full application. Um, so we wanted to see requirements of, obviously of commitmental funds. Um, evidence of zoning. I think we knew that this might be a challenge in some new, new construction and some timelines and, and really pushing to the end of the year closing and the viability. So, so in order to meet um, our requirements to be considered for 2020 tax exempt volume cap, we wanted that we want evidence of zoning um, and, and really that ability to proceed to, to come in with that full application, which is July 10th. Um, similarly, uh, we put some guidance out there for historic and, and third party uh, HUD or RD approvals. So again, we're looking for um, that comfort or I'll call it that more likely than not, the projects will close in, in 2020. Um, just so that those who are participating or submitting an application, it's my understanding that the portal is now open it opened on Monday, um, so the full application can be submitted to the agency. So when we moved this date to July 10th, and um, we, we knew that we had a, a re relatively large pipeline, and we also knew that it might be a challenge for, for some of the, those on the list to, to meet some of these new requirements, um, we, we devised, I'll call it a plan B alternate process for those projects that submitted a 2020 application or preliminary application because we wanted to acknowledge that you know obviously uh, those had done a lot of work or were you know were really ready to go um, with regard to trying to close in, in 2020 but we also recognize that um, the projects might change due to uh, timelines and costs and I 
continue to sit, talk about the acquisition rehab, maybe the scope of work or the ability to where, you know, relocation plans might be changing. So we have our plan B for 2020. And what this is going to look like is a, um, I'll call it a bond inducement process. So for those projects that are, are still really, um, I'll call it cooked or, or, par, or par cooked, um, and we'll, would be closing, maybe might not be able to make the, the year end requirement, but would be able to close in the first half of 2021. Um, the agent's going to agencies accepting an updated preliminary application by September 1. Um, if we believe that the project is a viable project based on updated numbers and uh, that updated preliminary application, we will take it to the board for inducement, bond inducement, um, by the end of the year at one of our board meetings so that we will set aside the volume cap for the development, provided that the project closes within the, the six months from the date of that inducement. So we're going to still try to, to move them along very quickly. Um, some of these things, and, and I do want to share those of you who are in the, in the tax exempt space, um, I mentioned earlier that we have fair funds associated with these projects and we will hold it for for those that are coming in and saying, yes, I'm going to close by the end of the year or I'm going to go to this plan B. Um, if either one of those things are not met or it's evidence that they can't be met, we will um, recapture the, the fair funds and require a, a, re, a resubmission. So, so again, I think we just want um, all, all to take a look at the likelihood of projects moving forward. Um, our fair money is really a scarce resource and, and really, you know, previous to March, I would say, is, is, is a scarce resource. And now it's ever so, um, obviously, because we have lots of other needs and uses um, due to COVID in, in, the, in the shelter space and the um, homeless uh, continuum of care and other applications. It is. So, so again, um, we wanted to uh, continue to work with those that have, have under the previous um, program come in and guidelines ask for the money, but we also just wanted to be uh, practical that we want to be able to reallocate those funds um, to another use if it looked like the project wasn't moving forward. I think I'm getting close to the end and, and pretty good for time. It's amazing how it, uh, close to an hour goes by. Um, Elizabeth, you're, you keyed us up with a 2021-22 allocation plan. Um, our last allocation plan was a two-year plan. Um, I do believe it worked well for us. I know we made some interim changes um, last year. I anticipate that our next plan will also be a two-year plan. Um, we are in the process of working on some of the elements that we would be issuing a draft allocation plan, obviously, to go out for, for public comment. Um, you know, going back six months ago, I would have thought that we would have had an allocation plan for you for a July meeting, um, but uh, that is not going to, to, to be the case. Um, I do expect that we are going to be going through the process um, uh, early fall, late summer, so in the next couple board meetings and, and start to actually put some either surveys or questions out um, in public comment. Um, one of the things that I will share with you is that, and, and hopefully some of you have already looked, um, the agency uh, commissioned a housing study, um, uh, University of Pennsylvania, and it's really, I, I think it's gonna be a great tool for us. So, so we may be looking to um, include some of the, the methodologies that are they're in there for our allocation. So I'll use this as an example. We've been using urban and suburban rural. Um, that plan actually splits it out to um, urban large, urban small, and rural, um, and, and has some defined lines. So we're actually going to start taking a look at, you know, other methodologies. Um, also, really looking at at how we can um, uh, use the word rebuilding communities and, and some other things. So really looking to community revitalization plans and and really need in local communities. Um, so some of those things will change. And I think we're also with the goal of and we try to this year really have a streamlined process to get from award to closing uh, con to continue to do that. Historically, our application deadlines have been in the fall. Um, I, I, I don't think you need to circle a date for, you know, the middle of November for an application. I would, I would be looking to the first, right after the first of the year um, to make applications with the goal of, of, of still awarding in the summer. So, 
you know, November becomes January, uh, we would be making awards next summer. So I, I don't think there'd be any slippage in that time. And again, with maybe some streamline and, and looking at really every element in the allocation plan and say, you know, is it, is it, uh, is it a must have or a should have? And I think that that's how we're going to be um, looking at our allocation plan with the goal of, you know, building as many units as we can with the resources we have in the future. So, um, you know, there's an exclamation point at the end of that. Well, you know, we will be looking for your input. And and, and please continue to, to look at our website and, and look at guidance from the agency. And there you have it. We're at, we're at the, we're at, what? At the end, I just, I just put a couple telephone numbers. You know, people are, are have phones call forwarded. Again, I, I do want it to, to the credit, really all agency staff. I, I think everybody's been generally responsive and very responsive during this period. We are working remotely. I expect that we will be doing this in some form and fashion for some time, bringing staff in for a couple of days a week and, and, then, and then folks uh, working back at home. Um, so really the best way to reach people is still at their email addresses. Um, and, and, and I do believe that we all have the tools to, to make this work and, and go forward. So with that, I don't know if there was any questions. I, I know we're almost at the end. A few questions did come in. Um, we need to get our last two polling questions launched before we hit the questions. Well, I'm sorry. There you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's good. Your timing was perfect. So, um, if we want to go ahead and launch another polling question, where are you working from on a day to day basis? So are most people working at home, a mix of the office at home, or just are you fully in the office? Um, so we'll get these last two polling questions in, and then Holly, if you don't mind staying on the line for a That's few fine. minutes. That's fine, yep, yep, all and, good. Um, any participants who are out there, if you need to leave, that that's great after this last polling question, um, or if you wanna stay on and see if we can um, get a couple questions answered, that'd be great too. And we'll have 30 seconds to answer this polling question so we're probably down half of that so, so holly where are you working from on a day-to-day -day basis i have previously been working from home on a day-to-day -day basis um, but i am now in the office uh daily so okay. um you know we've been we've been actually we've been coming in a small group of us um have pulled the weekend shift for the last three months but now we we, we have our weekends back and, and I'm generally here in the office. My, my shift, I'm quoting, is from 7 to 3.30. So so I'm okay. here in my office at PHSA. And, and as I said earlier, our, our group is, is split. Yeah. Um, and just our last polling question here so people can get CPE credit. What is your favorite summer activity? So when you can stop thinking about tax credits and you can go out and do something fun, not that tax credits aren't fun, um, well, what is your favorite summer activity? And again, 30 seconds to answer the question. I have to say my favorite summer activity is sitting in, sitting on my screened in back porch and reading a book. That's very relaxing to me. Hopefully people will get to do their favorite summer activity this year and it won't be too interrupted by the pandemic. Oh, going to the beach. Yeah, that's a great, a great activity too. All right, so a couple questions here for Holly. Um, will the 120 day window for lease up costs be extended due to COVID-19? Or is this something that you will seek guidance on from the IRS? That was actually a question that we got um, last week in our place and service package uh, webinar. So I'm glad somebody asked that again. <laughs> so, so that's, I mean, that's really not a service that's been the agency standard. I do think that that's something that we can work with. I know that I've talked to Carl and Ed about it. I think that that's, you know, our guidance. And I think we have some, we have some flexibility um, in that. And I will, I will, I will write that as a note to follow up on. Great. Um, is PHSA Again, I think, I think we're I think we're going to just look at the reasonableness and where it is and, and whatnot. So I, I think that there's some flexibility. I'm sure people will be happy to hear that. Um, is PHFA looking into a fully electronic multifamily application submission? 
Um, I would say yes is the answer. Um, again, I think we are just electronic. It's, it's just the answer. We still like a hard copy because we're used to it. Um, uh, but again, I, I think that that is something that we are uh, working towards for, for next round. And somebody and, said, and the other thing and and the other thing is we are looking at some workflow tools and some other more robust software so that we can um, go back and forth and have some I'll call it records retention so that um, everything would just go back and forth uh, between us and and um, the applicants and, and that way we can keep we can um, reduce paper. Just wanted to clarify, it sounds like even 4% tax exempt applications for 2021 will not be accepted until early 2021. Is that correct? Um, uh, that was a sigh. Um, I would <laughs> know. Uh, so the, an the answer is we're going to have an RFP for our 2021. So as soon as the allocation plan is approved, we would then have um, the RFP available for the 20 as well 21 as well so we've all we've always accepted um the uh i'm, I'm sorry we've always accepted the the, the four percent earlier um but and i think maybe it would maybe whenever that opened up but i think we, we can take a look at having that timeline um more commiserate with the fall instead of waiting till till january if if it's going to be january Okay, um, another question came in here. Um, how are place and service deadline requests for 9% projects closing this year being handled? Okay, say that again. Um, uh -huh. I think they're asking how are place, <laughs> how are place and service deadline requests for 9% projects closing this year being handled? I think they're asking how, how to yeah. request an extension. Um, I, I, I think I th Okay, gotcha. So I, I think I think the question is this: I, I've got a, I'm a current project. I am I'm closing next week. I think it's going to be 18 months. How you know I'm not going to meet my meet my year end. What can I do? Those kind of things. Um, send send the request to me and copy Linda Stewart, and we're handling them when the project is really ready and ripe to close. So so again, I think we have not gone out and and set it an end date, you know, for for a closing deadline. But we do want to be reasonable um, when we make those accommodations. So very similar to the 20, the ones that are in that 2018 pipeline, um, you know, send the, send the request, but we want, we want to make sure that the project is um, well on its way with a reasonable expectation to close before we entertain them. Um, somebody asked, this is a great question, has the August PHFA board <laughs> meeting date been selected yet? I'm trying to plan for when awards will be announced. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's getting ready to party. I, I guess the news. I guess the, I guess the news is out, right? I, you know, I, I I've already gotten and before this call, before I even said that, you know, uh, I I hear you're going to be in August. Um, we have not. I don't think we have a date on. We do not have a date on the calendar right now. It's it's really the director and the board who will be working on that. Um, so uh, I I wish I had um a, a date to share with you, but it is something that we are um taking a look at, and as soon as we know it, we'll we'll share. You mentioned there were some updates to the Enterprise Green 2020 guidelines. Are those posted somewhere on PHFA's website? I don't. I would. I would probably go to Enterprise Green, but I can. I know that I. What I'll do is I will share, and that's a good idea. We will post the notice that I just sent out on our website. Um, I know that, it, and and maybe you want to touch base with Stan Sawalki. And actually, Stan's retiring, so you only have a week to get a hold of Stan. That, that's that's something I usually cover at these meetings. Uh, you know, who's leaving, who's retiring. Um, Stan Sawalki, who has been a great resource and and um, has really uh, been a, a yeoman and, and and done great things here at the agency. He he is retiring. Stan's last day is next Friday. So, any of you out there want to reach out to him and wish him well? Please do. Um, but yeah, but again, will, I, I can I can, I can post something or get that. Yeah. Yeah, I can. That came from him. They had they sat in on a uh, an Enterprise Green webinar with some of the changes. Two things: I'll make sure that that um, the information gets posted on our website, and um, and uh, share anything that I may know. I can do that. 
All right, here's another question. Um, what can developers do to find out if the agency is not providing their 8609 because the agency is waiting on information to complete the place and service package review? How can it complete if I, I, I'm, I'm confused with the, what are we waiting for, I guess, is the question. If it's not a complete um, package or is I'm it? I'm guessing this, this, yes, this may be as a result of our <laughs> webinar last week um, where we said <laughs> that if you don't complete, submit a complete package, it can cause a delay. So I think somebody's just asking right. if, 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 how so, do we so know? So as, as, as we go through for me. Okay, so um, we have a few reviewers here now, um, and just so you know, we did bring on, uh, and I think I might have shared this last year too, um, we have brought on some additional staff who are doing the first reviews for the complete package, um, and so they'll reach out to you directly. And I do want to share, and, and I know that this is, you know, a common question and a common talking point of, of our 86 owner process. Um, we are we are working we are working through them. I do think one of the challenges, and it is it is a relationship, and it is a give and take. Um, and, and I will just share it. The, the number of times we get requests for, can you tell me where it is? Can you confirm that I've received it? Can you, where am I in the line and all those things? And, and, and every time we get that question, um, it just adds more time to us reviewing it. So, uh, and I would just even share this. One of our reviewers said, you know, I got a call last week from the developer, from the consultant, and from the accountant the same week. Um, you know, we, we'd like to just speak in one voice to, to one entity. I'll share that. Um, and, and again, if it's here and if it's only been here two to three months or two months, um, I would expect that, you know, we're just in the space to do our, for our first reviews. So I, I think that's the timing um, on, on those first reviews. Uh, one more question here. Oh, maybe two more. Do you know who is taking Stan's place yet? I do not. I think I know, but I, it's not official, so I'm not at liberty to share. No breaking news today on the webinar. <laughs> no breaking news. My <laughs> lips are sealed. My lips are sealed. Preliminary applications are due on September 1st. Is this time timeline different for applications requesting FAIR funding? Okay, so the preliminary, when I mentioned this earlier, the preliminary application is only for those bond projects. So I mentioned we're having this bifurcated process for those that may not close in 2020 that, that came in with their initial preliminary application for volume cap um, on, on, on April 1st. That deadline's only applicable to those projects. So if, if you can't submit, if those 23 projects are not ready to close by the end of the year and have all of those requirements fulfilled, instead of submitting on July 10th, we want an updated preliminary on September 1. So we would have to refresh that first packet because we would think that things may have changed since that April 1 packet. So update on funding commitments, an updated spreadsheet, those kind of things. So that only applies to those projects. It does not apply to the 9% deals. All right, I think that is the end of our questions. Uh, thank you, Holly, and thanks again to everyone for joining us for today's webinar. If you have any further questions regarding today's presentation, please feel free to reach out to Holly or me. A recap of today's presentation will be posted on our website in a few days. And for those of you who are looking for CPE credit, look for a survey to complete after the webinar closes. Certificates will be sent out within the next couple of weeks. Finally, we invite you to save the date for our 2020 Fall Affordable Housing Seminar. We hope to be able to see many of you in person for this, but we'll keep an eye on the pandemic and provide more information about this event as soon as we have it. Our fall seminar is currently planned for Thursday, September 24th and features AJ Johnson. Uh, for those of you who don't know AJ, he is president of AJ Johnson Consulting Services, which is a real estate consulting firm specializing in due diligence and asset management issues with a particular emphasis on properties utilizing the low income housing tax credit. Thanks again for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.